Good morning. Welcome to worship. It's on a beautiful day. And before we started worship, I just kind of wanted to have a little conversation uh, among the family. So something is happening on Tuesday. We're going to have an election. And the lead up to the election has been so sweet and wonderful and peaceful and uniting in this nation, hasn't it? Or perhaps not. And I just kind of want to talk about that for a minute because we're going to wake up on Wednesday or Thursday, depending how things go, um, with counting. Um, and there's going to be a new president. And there are going to be people that are thrilled and there are going to be people that are angry. There's going to be people that are indifferent and everything else across the spectrum. And as I've mentioned a few weeks ago, or a little over a month ago, uh, as a congregation, we are a reflection of the image of God in the people. And that means not, it means two things. One, we are united, but we're also very diverse. We are united through Christ Jesus, but we're very diverse in our views and a lot of other things as well. And there are going to be people that on Tuesday, or have already, if you voted early, uh, will cast ballots that are blue and those that will cast ballots that are red. And that's okay. Because neither party, last I looked, at least when I got my sample ballot, I didn't see Jesus on the ballot. So, that means there's not, perhaps, or no, there isn't. I'm not even going to say perhaps. There doesn't mean that there, there is an easy or biblical answer to it. And there are people who have prayed about this that will cast their ballot one way, and people who have prayed about it who will cast their ballot the other way. And that's okay. And all of us, because we participate in politics, probably need to say the little prayer on our way out of the booth, Father, forgive me, for I have sinned. <laughs> because I put trust in a frail human who may not be the really good representation. Okay? But I also want us to understand something, that within this body, we don't bring the divisions, as I've said before, we don't bring the divisions of politics here. Because Christ is who we serve. And we serve him in all things, in all things and at all times. And so I just want us to remember a couple things. One, we're always praying for our nation. And we're praying for our leaders, whether we, we voted for them or not. And we are going to keep the divisions that the world would want to use to divide us as a country and as a people and even as a church at arm's length. And we will proclaim the truth that through Jesus Christ we are one, despite our diversity. And we will keep praying and being a light unto the world. Remember, Jesus Christ had an opportunity to become an earthly king. And he turned it down. You know why? Because being king of a nation is nothing compared to being the king of the kingdom of God. And Jesus is the kingdom of all people. He's the one who reigns and rules in our hearts and over this world. And one day we will see him. And he will set all things right. Until then, we deal with what we got. Okay? But most of all, we love our family. Our family that is red and our family that is blue and our family that is purple. And we celebrate that no matter what, the one truth will be for sure come January 6th and January 20th. Christ sits on the throne. And that's good enough. 
Let's pray uh, for our nation and let us pray for ourselves as we witness in this world. Heavenly Father, you know, you know what's coming on Tuesday. You have seen and heard everything that has transpired. And you know that in our lives it seems huge and world-shaking, and it is perhaps. But we also recognize that you've got a whole lot of other people that don't live in this country that you care about too. So we just ask that you would remember us and that your spirit would move in our midst and that you would help us to be united as one people, that we would be a united states. And Lord, heal the divisions, heal the hurts and the anger, heal that which divides us so that we might be together and stronger. And we pray, Lord, that you will help us to be your people in our faith through Jesus Christ. Lord, bring peace to our country this Tuesday and in the days to follow. May there not be conflicts and divisions. May you keep the political rancor at bay, and may we see your light shine in the midst of all that will go on this next week and in the weeks to come. Lord, bring your peace, bring your comfort, Bring your strength and bring your light, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Good morning. Today's reading is from Isaiah 61. I'll be reading verses 1 through 3 from the New Living Translation. Good news for the oppressed. The Spirit of the Lord, Sovereign Lord is upon me, for the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to comfort the brokenhearted and to, complain, sorry, and to proclaim that captives will be released and prisoners will be freed. He has sent me to tell those who mourn that the time of the Lord's favor has come and with it the day of the Lord's anger against their enemies. To all who mourn in Israel, he will give a crown of beauty for ashes a joyous blessing instead of mourning, best of praise instead of despair. In their righteousness, they will make like great oaks that the Lord has planted for his own glory. Good morning. We're reading um, Psalm 34, uh, the New Living Translation. I will praise the Lord at all times. I will constantly speak his praises. I will boast only in the Lord. Let all who are helpless take heart. Come, let us tell the Lord's greatness. Let us exalt his name together. I prayed to the Lord and he answered me. He freed me from all my fears. Those who look to him for help will be radiant with joy. No shadow of shame will darken their faces. In my desperation I prayed and the Lord listened. He saved me from all my troubles. For the angel of the Lord is a guard. He surrounds and defends all who fear him. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, the joys of those who take refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his godly people, for those who fear him will have all they need. Even strong young lions sometimes go hungry, but those who trust in the Lord will lack no good thing. Come, my children, and listen to me, and I will teach you to fear the Lord. Does anyone want to live a life that is long and prosperous? Then keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn away from evil and do good. Search for peace and work to maintain it. The eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right. His ears are open to their cries for help. But the Lord turns his face against those who do evil. He will erase their memory from the earth. The Lord hears his people when they call to him for help. He rescues them from their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. The righteous person faces many troubles, but the Lord comes to the rescue each time. For the Lord protects the bones of the righteous. Not one of them is broken. Calamity will surely destroy the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be punished. But the Lord will redeem those who serve him. No one who takes refuge in him will be condemned. As we come to communion this morning, I want us to 
spend a little time reflecting on the one who gives us freedom, on Jesus Christ. And I need to scan back here. Because Christ is our King. And this whole month, we're going to be talking about Christ the Good King. And He is the Good King who sets us free. That's the theme of of today. And what's interesting about this is I think that sometimes we forget that the freedom that Christ gives us is an ongoing process that happens through our entire lives. We don't just get saved once and then everything is perfect after that. Well, at least it wasn't my experience. Maybe it was yours, you know. But I'm kind of guessing that for most of us, you know, we, we, we put our faith in Jesus Christ and we have our sins forgiven And then as we grow in faith, we discover that over time, there's more things that need to get worked on. And through the Holy Spirit convicting us, He continues to touch us, and we continue to grow, and He continues to free us from those things that we have held on to or have held on to us. There's a really interesting uh, passage in John. Uh, We know it is, so if the Son sets you free, you are truly free. Jesus says this. Uh, to a group of uh, Jewish leaders that are standing near him there. And he said, Jesus said to the people, you believe in him uh, who believed in him. These are people who believed him. You are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings. And you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. We like that. What's interesting is the response that others had there that were critical of Jesus, they said, but we are descendants of Abraham, they said. We have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean you will be set free? I want you to think about that statement. Jewish people living under Roman occupation, Jewish people whose main storyline is the story of the Exodus, because God brought them out of where? Egypt, where they were slaves. And then later, because of the rebellion, they go into the exile, where they are enslaved by the Babylonians. And even when they come home, they never have their own king on the throne. And yet they have the audacity to say to Jesus, What do you mean? We're already free because we're Abraham's children. You know, I I think sometimes Jesus bit the inside of his lip to keep from (laughs) saying what he wanted to say. And we look at that and we think, well, that's really funny. Why can't they see how they are enslaved even at that moment under the Romans? And yet I think sometimes we're not very good at looking in the mirror either. And We want to talk about Christ setting us free, but we're not not always ready to admit that we need to be set free. And as today, as we come to the Lord's Supper, we need to recognize that in the Lord's Supper is a meal of freedom. First of all, when the first Passover meal was celebrated, which Jesus is celebrating at the Last Supper, where were the Israelites when they celebrated their first Passover meal? They were in Egypt. And it was marking that the death angel was going to pass over them, and the very next day, what happened? They were set free. And they were given the command to celebrate this Passover every year to remember that God had set them free. And so Jesus sits down at a celebration that is about being set free from slavery to the Egyptians. And he celebrates this meal with them. Except then he does something different. He's holding the cups of remembrance and the bread. And he changes it to, this is the cup of the new covenant. My blood which was shed for you. 
He's fulfilled the old covenant they lived under, the law, which had chained them and held them so that they might have freedom through the grace of Jesus Christ himself. They are set free as we are set free through the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Ash, if you could go back, it's easier for you to go back to the communion slide for me. Thank you. So when we come to communion this morning, as we're thinking about being set free through our faith in Jesus Christ, we need to remember that in the cup and the bread, there is freedom to live a new way in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. And recognize also, because remember who was sitting around that table? It was his disciples, wasn't it? Did every one of those disciples have their faith in Jesus Christ absolutely worked out perfectly? No, there was one who was going to betray him, and there was one who was going to deny him, and they were all going to run away. And he still offers them his grace and freedom to be free in him from their sins and their past. So when we come to the table today and we hold the cup and the bread, Jesus knows what's going on in our hearts. He knows what's going on in our lives. He knows those things that we still are holding on to that we're not ready to let go to him yet. We know, he knows those scars and wounds that are inside us that cause us to react and respond and behave the way we do at times, even when we don't want to do that. He knows the things we wrestle with. And he says, I come to you in the symbol of the cup and the bread, bringing you freedom so that you might walk new and fresh through the grace of Jesus Christ. So this morning as we come to receive the elements in a little bit, Bob will be joining me here. You'll be dismissed by the ushers to come down. And we'll have the elements. We'll have the bread and the cup here. You can... Take them and go and kneel here and have a quiet word of prayer. If kneeling is problematic with your knees, you can stand here or sit there. If we need to bring it to you, we can do that as well. But as you come forward this morning, you are welcome to come and receive the cup and the bread as you seek after Jesus Christ this day. And as you pray, thank him for all that he's done for you and for his son Jesus Christ, who we remember every time we celebrate the Lord's Supper. But then also, perhaps today, ask him to set you free from whatever it might be that might hold you back from serving him a little bit more faithfully, taking another step closer to him, walking a little closer to him. And he will do that. Because when we take the elements, we're remembering the freedom that comes through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We call it salvation because he saves us from ourselves and our sinfulness and those things that we're not ready to let go yet. And yet he says, I love you right where you're at, and I want to take you even further. Join me in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, this day there are there are no words to express our gratitude for your love for each one of us. Lord, to, to be able to say thank you for your son Jesus Christ, that you loved us so much that you came into this world so that if we'd put our faith in you, we might have a new life today and an eternal life forever. Thank you, Lord, that you meet us where we're at, on our good days and our bad days, when we've got it all going our way and when nothing is going our way, when we are feeling as if we're on top of the world or we're sitting at the bottom of the valley, you are there with us and we thank you, Lord, that we are never alone, but we are always with you. And we thank you that we are not only with you and that you are with us, but that we have a family here in this congregation that we might sit with through all those times and a congregation that we are so thankful for that we might worship with on Sunday mornings. And Lord, as we come to this time of communion, as we prepare to hold the symbols of your shed blood and your body, as we remember the gift of salvation that was worked for us on the cross, the forgiveness for all of our sins, and the hope 
of a new life today and eternal life tomorrow in the resurrection. As we hold those symbols, as we reflect on those things, we simply ask that you would speak to us this day and help us to let go of those things, those fears, those anxieties, those worries, those troubles, those addictions, those things that chain and hold us, those past wounds, those things that we need to let go. And we will take our healing from you, our deliverance from you. And just as you have brought us out of death to new life, we look forward to walking closer to you. So bless this time, bless these elements, and help us, O oh Lord, to hear your voice speaking to us. Lead us and guide us as we look for that day that you return and set all things right. But until that day, Lord, we will keep following and we will keep praying as you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, as he gathered with the disciples for his meal, he took a loaf of bread, and having blessed it, he broke it apart, and he passed it to them and said, Take and eat, for this is my body. Then later in the meal, he took a cup, and having blessed the cup, he said, Take and drink. For this is my blood which is shed as a symbol of the new covenant. When we take the symbol of the body and the symbol of the blood, we join ourselves to Christ and his grace and his mercy, the hope and the promise of his freedom, and the calm assurance of eternal life through him. May everyone who seeks after Jesus come and receive this morning. So as we start our month of November, there are two things that I think are always important in the month of November. One is we spend some time thinking about our gratitude for all that God has done. November really is a month with Thanksgiving in it where we need, as people who have been blessed, to pause and be grateful. Not that we shouldn't be grateful the rest of the year. We, we should be. But there's something about the fall and the harvest season, and, and I don't know if it's seeing pumpkins, but there's something about November that I think helps us settle and say we need to be thankful. And so this month we're going to be holding thankfulness in one hand, and the other thing that we're going to be holding is uh, a church celebration that happens at the end of November, just the last Sunday before we get to Advent, because, you know, Christmas is coming. I don't know how many days are left. I don't worry about that at this point. But it's coming. And the last Sunday before we get to Advent, which starts our new year, is Christ the King Sunday, where we remember that the King that sits on the throne is Christ. And so we'll be talking about Christ, the good King, and the things He does that we are grateful for. And today we start with He is the one who sets us free. We shouldn't be surprised that freedom is a theme that runs throughout Scripture. Because bondage to sin is the counterpoint theme that runs through Scripture. But God is the God who's always setting His people free through my acts of might and power, we see them leading them through the Red Sea and out of Egypt and through the wilderness to freedom, from their slavery there to the promised land. We see him defending them there and in countless places when the enemies come to attack them through the angel armies, through the mighty work of the hands of God, through the blessing of godly leaders who rise up. God is always working to set his people free. We also know that he's the, people, he's the God who sets his people through through proper 
to, so that they might have proper worship and proper living. Part of the freedom that he gives them coming out of slavery in Egypt is the law, the Ten Commandments, the Torah, the law. I use T and T there because they did not have enough words, space to spell out tabernacle and temple. And then the Jubilee years. And this freedom, which comes in the form of law and action, things to do, things not to do, ways to worship in the tabernacle, the sacrificial system, all of that is all about helping them be free from pagan worship, which is always trying to encroach upon them and allure them, and from the injustice, enslavement, from their debt, from exhaustion and poverty and starvation. If they will follow the commandments and take their Sabbath rest, they will have energy. If they will follow their commandments and trust in the Lord God to always provide, they will always have enough. If they will trust in the Lord God Almighty to follow the Jubilee years, every Sabbath year, every seventh year, where you trust God to provide food for the year, and then the Jubilee years where you cancel the debts. Wouldn't we all like a Jubilee year? Tomorrow you get a letter saying your debt has been canceled. Your mortgage, your credit cards, your school loans, your auto loans, we'd all like that, wouldn't we? It's the Jubilee year. And if they had followed it faithfully, they could have lived in that. Because God is setting His people free, not just from the physical slavery of being in bondage to another nation, but from their own sinfulness that causes them to live in unjust and wrong ways. But the people kept enslaving themselves, didn't they? I mean, it doesn't take long reading through the Old Testament. In fact, you don't have to read through it. You can just kind of pick and choose, and you'll find that time and time again, instead of following God's way of freedom and good whole living, they keep saying, well, you know what? That looks pretty good over there. And they start worshiping pagan gods and, worship in, and following foreign customs. Injustice and corruption spreads through their court system. But God is calling them out for it. They refuse to follow the law, and in refusing to follow the law, they live in rebellion against God. And instead of finding the freedom they think they get, they find them ensla themselves enslaved again. So God, who is the God who sets his people free, comes in the form of his son, Jesus Christ, to end all of the ultimate oppression. Oh, they wanted the Messiah to come and set them free from the Romans, kick the Romans out, let us do our own thing. As if doing their own thing had worked well for them before. God says, no, we've gone down that road before and you didn't follow the law, you didn't follow the commandments, you kept enslaving yourself, so let me defeat that which is ultimately your enemy. And ultimately what enslaves you, and that is sin and death and fear. And so in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, God himself stepped onto this world, fully human and fully divine, taught us how to live, laid his life down on the cross as a sacrifice for our sins, not his own, because he had none. And then he was raised from the dead on the third day from the tomb to give us new life today and eternal life tomorrow and set us free from that which ultimately holds us back. Now, we have continued to be a lot like our ancestors and found new ways to imprison ourselves. Now, biblically, we use the term sin, but sin has a pretty big meaning, really. It covers a lot of different things. But through our sinful choices and our sinful actions, we rebel against God and we find ourselves imprisoned again. Our sinfulness is in our selfishness, me over you, me over everybody else. Our self-determination, hey, I'll do my own thing the way I want to do my own thing no matter what. About our self-aggrandizement, we think we are all that and whatever else. Bag of chips, thank you. We think we're self-important. We're the ones that know everything. We're the ones who determine everything. And our selfishness leads us to hurting and harming not only others but ourselves. It leads us to 
committing injustice and exploitation and denigration of others. It leads us to surrendering our lives to everything but God. And that's what sinfulness is. Sinfulness is surrendering ourselves to anything but God. Whether that's ourself, or that's an activity, or an action, or a desire, or a hunger, or a want. When we say, no, I want that over God, we have stepped into the sinfulness that imprisons us again. And we can be imprisoned by our thoughts. How many times has your thoughts held you back and changed you? By our addictions and our decisions that we've made that put us on a path that we don't think we can get off of. Sometimes we're imprisoned because other people, parents or guardians or others around us, make decisions that impact our lives or wound us. Or society has expectations and rules that prevent us from being faithful to God. Or our past scars and our traumas. One of the things I've started doing and trying to work through some things in my own life is try to look past the moment of explosive disagreement that I might have with somebody else. I know none of you ever run into that. You don't have any triggers and nothing kind of causes you to go off the deep end or react in any way. I I get that, so this is just me talking about myself here. But what I've discovered is some of the things that happen to me in my life, some of the choices I may have made, or some of the choices others made around me or behavior that they had, left some scars and some trauma. And sometimes I'm acutely aware of that, and sometimes I'm not till somebody that I care tremendously about says something to me, and I don't know who's talking in their response to that statement. Have you ever had those moments where somebody says something or somebody does something and it triggers something inside you and suddenly it comes out? And it's never, it's never what was the problem, it's always just your response to it. And I've started asking myself when I see that happen in others, rather than just saying they're bad, I ask myself, what happened to them? that caused them to behave that way. Because I'd like that same grace when I trip up and blow up like that. And those scars and those traumas, they can imprison us. They can scar us. And sometimes it's our present worries and our fears and anxieties and the circumstances that we're in that cause us to do things, either to make ourselves feel better in the moment or to lash out at others thinking somehow That is the way we settle our fears or we fall into issues of uh, control. You don't know anybody who has control issues, I'm sure. (laughs) Trying to maintain everything because we're afraid it was of what might happen. These are the things that imprison us. And yet God is the God who sets his people free. And he's the one who comes to us and says, I see you where you're at. I know where you've been. I know everything that has happened to you. I know what's going on in your life right now. That which you want everybody else to see and that which you don't want anybody else to see. And I know what is worrying you about tomorrow. And I want you to know that I've got it. And I can take care of you. And I can set you free from all these things that you think nobody can do anything about. Paul wrote a letter to a church in Galatia. Now, in our map here, you recognize Italy there. You see down here where Palestine is. And then the middle area, the Asia Minor, you see Galatia right there. There's a whole bunch of churches up in there, and that's where Paul first went and he preached the gospel. And the gospel that Paul preached to them was you are free in Christ Jesus. You are free from the law which you had before as Jewish people. You are free from pagan worship. You are free from your sins through Christ Jesus. And he sort of sums this up. This is actually in chapter 2, where he has a conversation with Peter. Uh, He and Peter, uh, 
he reports this conversation. And he said it this way with Peter. You and I are Jews by birth, not sinners like the Gentiles. Gentiles are everybody who's not Jews. So, those without God. Yet we know that a person is made right with God by faith in Jesus Christ, not by obeying the law. Amen? Yeah, we know that. And we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we might be made right with God because of our faith in Christ. Not because we obeyed the law, for no one will ever be made right with God by obeying the law. But suppose we seek to be made right with God through faith in Christ, and then we are found guilty because we have been abandoned the law. What he's saying is, what if the fear in the back of our mind, as we become Christians and not Jews, is that what if the law still matters? Would that mean, that if we didn't keep the law, that Christ has led us into sin? Absolutely not. Christ can't do that. Rather, I'm a sinner if I rebuild the old system of the law that I already tore down. For when I tried to keep the law, it condemned me, so I died to the law. I stopped trying to meet all its requirements so that I might live for God. My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not treat the grace of God as meaningless, for if keeping the law could make us right with God, then there was no need for Christ to die. Through Christ, we have been set free. By our faith in Him, by our trust in Him, by our surrender of ourselves to Him and our desire to walk in the way that He teaches us to walk, whether that's the Sermon of the Mount or all the teachings that are contained in the Gospel, it's our desire to walk faithfully with Him. And that is what saves us. And we need to remember that because sometimes it's real tempting to come up with other things that are more in our control to save us. If I do this or that, or if I do what I used to do, or if I do what my parents used to do, if I could go back to something that existed before in the church or in Christianity, well, then that would save me. No grace saves us. We are set free. And it's not by our own works. Yesterday I I did a wedding in here. And the couple that was um, married had both, are are both alcoholics that have been sober for heading towards double digit years now, if not more. And what is wonderful when you're working with that group, and I love being around that group, and I do a lot of funerals for them, unfortunately, but I do some weddings with them and and so forth. And what I love about them is they know they didn't get sober on their own. They know they didn't break the chains of their addiction because they had good self-will. Because if they had had self-control, they wouldn't have gotten there to start with. They know it was from their higher power. They know it was from God. It was no, it's their knowing that Jesus is the one that delivered them out of that. They're just honest about that. And I appreciate that. Because sometimes I think in the church we forget that. And we think that somehow it's been our own righteousness, our own good deeds, our own prayer life, our own scripture reading, our own knowledge of God that has somehow got us to that point. It's been our goodness that has saved us. We have gotten so far away from that point that we surrendered our lives to Christ that we forgot it's Him who delivered us and we start thinking it is us who has delivered us. And that is a dangerous place to be. Because when we say that, we sound just like those Jewish people that looked at Jesus and said, what do you mean be set free? We've never been slaved by anybody. And Jesus is going... Egyptians and Babylonians and the Philistines and the Moabites and the, you know. And I think sometimes we think, I've arrived because I'm a good Christian. And Jesus goes, well, let me talk about this and let me talk about that and let me talk about this and let me talk about that and let me talk about that. You know? Because our faith in Jesus Christ is what sets us free. Not our perfection, 
not our getting it right so that we might be acceptable to him, but accepting his rightness so that he can clean us up and he can break the chains that bind us. And we need to be able to look in the mirror honestly. Say, what I see in the mirror is someone who is loved by God. But what I also see in the mirror is someone who may have some miles to go yet. But it's also the fact that when I look in the mirror, I'm never seeing just myself. Because if I spiritually look in the mirror, I know that the one who stands beside me is always Jesus Christ. And he's there to deliver me through through the temptations of my day, through the temptations of my life, to keep me on the path, leading me and guiding me everywhere I go. Ash, if you could take me to the end of my sermon. Well, sermon notes, there's a picture there. There we go. When I walk with Jesus, he leads me into freedom. He leads me out of the bondage of my sinfulness into the presence of his life. He leads me through this red sea of storms of life. He leads me through the wilderness. He leads me into the promised land. He leads me when I can walk no more. He carries me. There's a little chorus that I think of. I won't sing it for you. Lord, take my hand and lead me on. Let me stand. I am tired. I am weak. I am worn. Through the storm and through the night, lead me on to the light. Take my hand, precious Lord. Lead me home. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. And yet by God's grace... He will lead us where? Home. When we let the chains fall broken behind us, when we own our sins and our failures and our worries and our anxieties and our cares and our scars, and we say, they're yours, God. I'm leaving them behind and I'm walking with you and you alone. True freedom comes. Through Christ and nothing else. May we open our arms to the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ, accept his forgiveness. May we surrender all that which stands between us and him so that he might gently gather us in his arms and take us home. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, help us this day as we seek to be your children in this time and this place. You know all the things that we wrestle with, those things that others see and those things that nobody is allowed to see but you. And we ask, O Lord, that you would speak your peace and your grace into our lives this day. Come set us free. Break the chains that bind us to our old lives and help us walk faithfully into our new life through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. A couple of... Quick announcements. Uh, as I mentioned at, in my annual report this year, uh, starting in November, we're going to be doing something new. We're going to be praying for uh, churches in our community. And the first one that we we're praying for this week is Bay Life Church, which is just, we're here to, in Orchard Beach. Um, and uh, we are, so I encourage you this week, uh, if you, in your prayer time, just lift them up and ask that God would work in their lives and their church and that uh, help them as we all continue to work together to share the grace of Jesus Christ. Men's Community Breakfast is this Tuesday morning at 3B's Bakery at 7.30 in the morning. Um, and come out and join us for that. Uh, women's Worship Workout is Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Morning Bible Study in uh, Wednesday mornings is at 10.30 a.m. We meet back here in the Old Chapel. Uh, we... We'll get out of the book of Daniel in the next couple weeks, but we're working through the smaller books of uh, the Old Testament. Um, while I'm on this one, Wednesday night, um, yes, Wednesday night, uh, youth group, we have youth group at 7 to 
Uh, once again, as you remember, we're working with Youth for Christ now, um, but come and be a part, our youth group, come and be a part of that uh, meeting downstairs in uh, the, there in the uh, cave uh, or fellowship hall. So come, all of our young people come and be a part of that on Wednesday nights. Wednesday night family night will be starting up here in November. Uh, once again, we're putting food donations together for Thanksgiving. Uh, turkeys, canned goods, and cash donations that are needed for our uh, Thanksgiving boxes. There are boxes placed out there in the narthex. If you bring a turkey and put it in the freezer downstairs, don't just put it in the box, just <laughs> saying. Uh, if you have questions, see Bob or Sherry, and they have the information about that. But we give, last year we did food for heading towards 20 people, wasn't it? 20 families, something like that. And so we'd love for you to contribute anything for that. If you want to do the, the shopping uh, and buy it and bring it, that's great. Or if you want to give a cash donation, you can do that as well. Uh, Stallings Funeral Home is having their lunch and learn about um, the funeral process on Wednesday, this Wednesday at 11 a.m. If you'd like to sign up to be a part of that, you can do that out there. Soup and Sandwich is coming up Sunday, November 17th. Woohoo! We're always excited about a little soup. Yeah, we're always a little excited about a little soup and sandwich, right? Uh, anyway, you can sign up to bring soups uh, out there. If you have questions, see Ginger. She has all the answers that, to anything. Um, basic Christianity class today, right after uh, morning worship service, we'll be meeting downstairs. Uh, we're going to be talking about the church, the who, the what, the hows, the whys, and what it means to do church here at Jenkins. Come and be a part of that. We do have lunch for you. And... Um, so we'll be gathering down there. Dan, you got stuff downstairs? Uh, we have a real nice selection of sweets down there, uh, breads, and uh, some fruits, not very much. Now remember this afternoon, another announcement for local happenings. The uh, Thanksgiving Day Parade is gonna be going down Tick Neck Road, uh, down uh, Mountain Road. Uh, if you want to get over to that, that starts at two o'clock. I did not know of parade activities. The first Sunday of November every year. Where has this been for the last three years I've lived here? The same place. The same place. It's a the Pasadena Business Parade. Apparently this is a hidden secret that has been kept from me until this moment. Well, we're always here, so... Yeah, okay. I warned okay. you about that before the service. Yeah. Where I'm standing. Yeah, yeah, who knows, who knows. Okay, uh, we got parade activities. We are... Uh, <laughs> contributing indirectly because the some of the bags that would have come to us are going to the people that are putting the parade on. Okay. They're asking for food donations. So. Very, very good. Take some food donations, go enjoy the parade. Is there an inflatable turkey? Is this like... Sometimes, yes. Sometimes, yes. Okay. We inflate. <laughs> I, I see where I'm spending my afternoon, I can tell you that. I, I, I have Downstairs. new plans. I thought I was going to walk the dog, but I'm thinking... Yes, Murphy at the parade, I don't think that's happening. If God has been speaking to you this morning, there's stuff going on in your life, you'd like someone to pray with you, our deacons will be available after the morning service and would love to sit and pray with you. Go be kind. Go be light in the darkness. Be back next Sunday. But until then, may you know the love of God, the salvation of Jesus Christ, and may you let the Holy Spirit hold you in his hand now and forever. Go in God's peace. Amen.